Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Grassley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for General Garland for being here. My first question is a follow-up to a line of questioning you had with Senator Cotton. Uh, you told this committee that, quote, the executive branch cannot simply decide based on policy disagreements that it will not enforce the law at all, end of quote. Then you released a December 16th, uh, 22 uh, memo uh, instructing prosecutors to disregard the law that established sentencing differences between cocaine and cocaine base. Your decision not to enforce the law ended congressional discussions at that particular point. Uh, for a compromise. If a DOJ uh, claims that it will ignore the law by declining to prosecute a law that grew out of a bipartisan compromise forged in this committee, it's hard to see how members uh, can trust the department about uh, following any further bipartisan deals. So I'm going to ask you, would you withdraw your memo so that a meaningful legislative discussion can resume? And if you don't have a uh, agreement with me, uh, why wouldn't you do that? Yeah, uh, uh, Senator, I, I want to be clear. We're not in any case saying that uh, we won't enforce the law. In all the examples that we're talking about here, people are being prosecuted for violation of the uh, Controlled Substances Act. It's only a question of what sentence we will seek. Um, and this has been a matter of prosecutorial discretion. Uh, we do not in any way limit the judge. We have to uh, honestly tell the judge what the um, uh, drug was and what the amounts was, but this is uh, goes to the question of what we will uh, charge and seek. But we, we but we are charging these people with violations of the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, on another point, the Department of Justice charged Nicholas Maduro with narco terrorism and drug trafficking offenses, and the Office of Foreign Assets uh, Control sanctioned him. Since then, the Biden administration has released three billion dollars and foreign Venezuelan assets and authorized Chevron Ron to drill. Does the Department of Justice still consider Nicholas Maduro a fugitive of U.S. justice? And if so, do you commit to diligently pursue his arrest? Um, I, I, to be honest, um, Senator, I, I really don't have any information. I know who Maduro is, obviously, and I know that he was charged. I don't know what his current status is. I'll be happy to look into that for you, though, oh, Senator. Will you answer in writing? Of course, of course. Uh, this will have to be my last question. I have strong concerns about competition problems in different areas of the economy. Example, I've conducted oversight and drafted legislation to address abuses in pharmaceutical, agriculture, and high-tech industries. Can you tell us what the antitrust priorities are for the uh, Justice Department under your leadership, and uh, are your resources follow following that? Priority. Yeah, so uh, our, our priority are um, um, uh, both to prevent increased uh, concentration uh, in industries that are already concentrated. Agriculture is a very good example. Um, uh, pharmaceuticals, another very good example. And therefore, um, to uh, closely look at uh, mergers um, and thank um, um, and, and to investigate them. Um, and our other priority and closely related is exclusionary conduct by dominant firms. Uh, and we are doing quite a bit of uh, that kind of work, as referenced by some of the cases you know we've filed. Uh, there are also we're also um, looking at criminal violations of the price fixing uh, statute and others with respect to resources. Um, this this is an area where we can always use more resources. We are faced on the opposite side with um, uh, companies with virtually unlimited resources. Um, I, I express gratitude for the Senate and the House uh, for the uh, Howard Scott Rodino uh, fees bill merger fees bill, which has given us more money uh, uh, to even up the playing field a little bit. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me start out, uh, Madam Secretary, with the full faith and credit issue that uh, my colleague Senator Wyden has raised. We are in agreement that we need to protect the full faith and credit of the United States. Uh, frankly, as I indicated in my opening statement, the problem that we see on the Republican side is that it's all tax and all spending increases in terms of the administration's approach to this. And while uh, you and the chairman just discussed a number of concerns you have with Republican ideas with regard to how to deal with this, uh, 
The bottom line is that we must stop trying to solve this problem by massive new spending and massive new taxes. So we have some disagreements about how to deal with this. What I would ask of you is, at this point, the President has refused to negotiate with Republicans on fiscal restraint policies that they believe need to be put into place with a, with a new extension of the debt ceiling. We must engage in negotiations to get over some of these disagreements, and this new debt ceiling resolution must include fiscal restraint. We've got to get some kind of attention to this. I think the American public is crying out for Congress to pay attention to this issue and put fiscal restraint in place. Can you commit at least to negotiate with Republicans as we try to work forward on finding some aspects of fiscal restraint to put into the debt ceiling discussion? Senator Crapo, the President has indicated that he considers it critically important to have a sustainable and responsible fiscal path. And he's put on the table in the budget um, a number of ideas, many ideas about how to grow the economy while also cutting deficits. And this is a matter that he is very prepared to discuss and negotiate with Republicans, but it can't be a condition for raising the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling simply must be raised, and to put at risk uh, the full faith and credit of the United States and to threaten to cause an economic and financial catastrophe isn't an acceptable well, I, um, Madam Secretary, requirement. I, understand, I interpret your answer to be that you're very willing to discuss the President's budget, tax increases, and increased spending, but you're not willing to discuss, with regard to the debt ceiling discussion, any actual fiscal restraint in terms of spending control in the United States. Now, if I interpreted it wrong, I'm sorry, but we've got to get negotiating on more than just whether the President's budget is the right approach. There are other ideas, and we need to be engaged in it. I just hope that you'll take that message back to the President. The President has indicated that he would welcome discussions about the stance of fiscal policy. All right, I appreciate that. Let's move uh, quickly to the uh, SVB crisis in, in the banking industry. Can we agree, at least as a starter, as we try to understand how this is all playing out, that the issue here in terms of risk is uh, liquidity risk that we are facing in the system and that SVB had a, an, a liquidity risk issue? Well, there was a, a run on the bank. It had high reliance on uninsured deposits, and um, there was a massive withdrawal of deposits that led to liquidity problems. The bank had to be closed for that reason. So do you agree, then, that it is a liquidity risk that we're dealing with in this issue? Well, there was a liquidity risk in this situation. I, um, you know, there there will be a careful look at what happened in the bank and what initiated this problem, but clearly the downfall of the bank, the reason it had to be closed, was that it couldn't meet depositors' um, depositors' withdrawal requests. Because their capital was being, uh, was losing value and they were not able to access their capital, and, and I attribute that to the interest rate hikes that we are seeing in in the face of the inflation. Am I wrong in that? Well, my understanding is that the bank, um, to meet liquidity needs, had to sell um, assets that it expected to hold to maturity. And um, given the interest rate increases that have occurred since those assets, including treasuries and government-backed um, security, mortgage-backed securities, they had lost market value. All right, yeah, and we're on the same page on that then. I appreciate that. One other question with regard to the uh, bank failure, and a this is with regard to the efforts to get a private buyer to help solve this issue. Uh, regarding these uh, issues, the solution would have been to get a private sector solution that protected taxpayers, calmed the markets, and prevented the potential assessments from being inappropriately levied, levied against community banks. Uh, press reports have indicated that some, at the, uh, some of the FDIC board members may have slow-walked the negotiations 
with regard to potential political backlash surrounding mergers and acquisitions. And uh, it was because of that that we were not able to move forward promptly with obtaining a buyer. Are those reports accurate? Well, this is something that uh, is a question for the FDIC, really, rather than me. But I, I know that the FDIC um, looked, looked for buyers, and a merger or acquisition is certainly uh, something that they were open to as a way to resolve the institution. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Very quickly, on the OECD agreement, uh, I'm very much opposed to it, yet it seems to me that Treasury is uh, pushing for Congress to approve its approach to the OECD negotiations and is already giving uh, support to nations around the world in the OECD to tax U.S. profits that would be directly in contrast or in conflict with U.S. tax treaties. Uh, am I correct in that? 137 countries signed this agreement and see it as a way to put a floor on taxation of corporations and uh, multinational corporations and stop a race to the bottom. And the European Union has adopted uh, Pillar 2, the global minimum tax, and I, other jurisdictions are moving forward. My and question, we my feel answer, it's in the U.S. interest to adopt this. We have, um, we have proposed. Um, I understand, Madam Secretary. My time has expired, and the chairman's trying to get me to wrap up. I do want to make one more quick statement. Uh, I would like to express my concern about numerous proposals in the Green Book in the budget that we won't have time to get into here today. Last year, Treasury did not provide answers to these questions for the record responses for six months. And I just would like to ask you to pay attention to this, this this year and have your team respond to us promptly as we get questions for the record on this year's budget. Senator Grafley. Yeah. You didn't answer his last question about OECD and tax treaties. Uh, is what you're proposing in any way a violation of the tax uh, treaties that we've had with other countries? No, there's no violation in anything we've proposed with um, yeah. tax tax treaties that we have engaged in. This is something that the OECD considered very carefully, and there's no violation of our tax treaty. Well, we surely don't agree with your analysis of that. Only Congress has the power to approve tax uh, treaties. Uh, I want to go to your uh, position as a member of the Social Security Board of Trustees. You and other people put out an annual report, uh, quote, lawmakers should address the projected trust fund shortfalls in a timely way in order to phase in necessary changes gradually and give workers and beneficiaries time to adjust to them, end of quote. I don't disagree at all with that statement. President Biden has claimed that his budget reduces the deficits while protecting Social Security. However, the President's budget includes no proposal to extend the solvency of the Social Security Trust Fund. Anyone who knows that things get done around here know what takes presidential leadership to lead major reforms to Social Security. Forty years ago, that was a President Reagan and a Democrat Speaker of the House, uh, Tip O'Neill, that put together a bipartisan agreement that was overwhelmingly approved by the Congress of the United States, and it's and it has made Social Security sound uh, at least through 2035. So I assume that you stand by your recommendations that lawmakers act sooner rather than later to shore up Social Security trust funds. So can Congress expect to see the President's proposal to put Social Security on a sound fiscal basis uh, along the same ways replicating the leadership of President uh, Reagan and Tip O'Neill? President Biden stands ready to work with Congress to shore up Social Security and discuss possible approaches. So that's a conversation that it's important for us to have. Um, he has made explicit proposals yeah. in connection with uh, Medicare and shoring it up. Yeah. Um, and um, it's important to have that conversation about Social Security. The President believes strongly that that should not involve cutting benefits 
or going back on our commitments to America's uh, seniors, but certainly it's a discussion we need to have. I assume that both you and the President are sincere in what you just said. It would help a lot if the President would quit demagoguing the Social Security issue the way he has in recent weeks. I want to go to uh, an extension of conversation you and I had June of 2021. Uh, you defended concerns about the President's spending proposals fueling inflation and interest rates hikes by saying this, quote, if we ended up with a slightly higher interest rate environment, it would actually be a plus for society's point of view and the Fed's point of view, end of quote. Uh, I want to emphasize plus for a society's point of view. Now, when you made that statement, inflation was 5.4% and the federal funds rate was effectively zero. Since that time, inflation hit a 40-year high and the Fed has responded by aggressively hiking interest rates. As a result, families and small businesses are paying the price by way of higher interest rate costs for home loans and business lines of credit. Moreover, bank failures this past week highlighted how fragile our economy is given rising interest rates and decades-long inflation. So do you still see our inflation-driven interest rates hike as, using your words, a plus for society? I consider high inflation um, the number one economic problem that all of us need to face and address. It's the President's top priority. Um, I was very supportive of the American Rescue Plan. Um, I, I think there are many factors that have contributed to high inflation. It's critical for the Fed to address it. And the President is doing all that he can, both through the Inflation Reduction Act, lowering costs of prescription drugs, uh, lowering the cost of health care, um, using the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to uh, try to lower and address um, higher gas and energy costs for Americans. Um, it's critical for us to do what we can to bring inflation down and for the Fed to do its part as well. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act um, was enacted at a time when I believe the greatest threat to our economy was that unemployment would remain shockingly high and that American families would be scarred by long-term job loss and losing the roofs over their heads and I believe it was appropriate to take those actions. My time has run out. Just let me finally say this, that uh, what you say about the Inflation Reduction Act, reducing inflation within the last three weeks, the CBO says that increased inflation. I yield. Thank, thank you, Senator Grassley. Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Continue. Senator Grassley is next. I don't understand your equivocation over whether or not these agreements ought to be submitted to Congress because the Constitution is pretty clear that the power to regulate interstate and foreign commerce is a constitutional power. So if you aren't going to submit these to the Congress for, uh, for uh, uh, consideration, it either comes from the laws that we have delegated to the President to do in interstate commerce what we ask him to do, because Congress isn't an institution that can do it, or you've got to have some constitutional power to do it. Now, I don't want that discussion with you, but I want you to know my opinion on that. When you were in Iowa, you heard about how concerned Iowa farmers are about Mexico's ban on biotech corn. I was glad to see USDR take action with technical consultations. It is now over two years since Mexico first published its decree. Uh, this seems to be an easy one and exactly what we included uh, that uh, why we included the dispute resolution process in USMCA with over 90% of the corn production in the United States planted with biotech seeds and Mexico being the number one purchaser of U.S. corns. Farmers deserve a sense of urgency from your administration on this. Now, after two years and consultation, uh, you put in, for, uh, in place uh, this... Uh, first step that takes to uh, get the uh, agreement going. And I thank you for doing that. And you did it 
uh, very timely. Uh, now, after uh, you, you said that all options are on the table when you had your opening statement, there is only one option, and on April the 7th, that's after 30 days, I would expect you to file a formal dispute settlement. Are you going to do that? Well, Senator Grassley, you speak on this issue loud and clear, and I hear you in terms of your expectations. Uh, we are in the process of the technical consultations, and just to be clear about what technical consultations mean, uh, that means sitting down at a table with Mexico and pressing Mexico to come forward with uh, the scientific basis uh, for uh, it, the aspects of its decree that impact our biotechnology um, agricultural uh, reports. So. Um, Senator Grassley, I will keep you apprised of how the current consultations are going, but you are absolutely correct about the rules under the USMCA and that 30 days after the filing of the technical consultations, we have the option of moving forward. Let me stay in very close contact with you about um, next steps. Well, if you don't let the Mexican government know right now that you're going to institute that, you're going to continue these conversations for the two years that they've already gone on and they're never going to end. You've got a process that has a end, end to it, and that process needs to be instituted, and it needs to be instituted on April the 7th. We've th been talking for two years. You are absolutely right that uh, we have those tools <clears throat> for a reason, and I assure you uh, that it is not my intention to allow this to go on okay. indefinitely. Uh, on to another matter. In your testimony, you mentioned that your agency will monitor the practices of other trading partners to ensure U.S. agricultural products are not subject to unfair, unjustified, and discriminatory restrictions. Last month, I led a letter with nine other senators around President Biden meeting with the President of Brazil. Just a week prior to that meeting, Brazil reinstituted a 16% tariff rate on U.S. ethanol. While Brazil may want more sugar access, they already have access to the U.S. with duty-free ethanol imports that qualify for renewable fuel standards in California's low-carbon fuel program. This is unfair, it's unjustified, and yet President Biden made no mention whatsoever that I know of about the new tariff when he had the chance. So I'm happy that you're focused on work-centric trade policy. Then can you uh, work with me to end the unjustified increase in U.S. ethanol tariffs? I'd be happy to. I also would like you to know that I was in Brazil two weeks ago and that my chief agricultural negotiator uh, will also be following up on this particular issue and that I most certainly did raise this on my trip to Brasilia. Um, in regard to whether or not you're going to have free trade agreements or not, and I don't understand why that those two words are uh, something that the administration never wants to utter, but uh, you're talking about having certain talks with Kenya, Ukraine, uh, UK, and a couple other countries, uh, uh, and you call them robust discussions. Robust discussions are not good enough. So my last question is, do you plan to pursue concrete market access commitments in any of the frameworks and initiatives that you're pursuing? So, uh, Senator Grassley, I'd like to take this opportunity to say that um, um, uh, I remain and we remain open-minded with respect to the more traditional approach to trade agreements. However, with respect to each individual partner that we negotiate with and with respect to the um, uh, U.S. economic and world economic situation, we want to make sure that our trade policies are tailored to the needs of the relationship and the needs of our economies. At this moment, we do not have tariff liberalization negotiations going on with a partner. However, I want to indicate to you that I remain open-minded that when it is fit for the partner and the times, uh, that um, uh, we are happy to uh, do the right thing by the U.S. economy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank my colleague. Senator Cardin's next to the chairman of the Senator Grassley. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Mr. Secretary. There are several reports of foreign nations like China purchasing 
of U.S. land for farming or agricultural purposes. Some of these tracts of land are suspiciously close to American military bases or critical infrastructure sites. Uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States expressed great concern in a North Dakota purchase of farmland by China is one example of their concern. How is Homeland Security working with the Department of Agriculture and law enforcement entities to track these types of suspicious land purchases? Uh, Senator Grassley, um, we are very focused on the threat that the People's Republic of China poses to the United States in a number of regards. You have cited one of them. Um, and we are uh, a member of CFIUS, uh, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the U.S., we are one of the departments that reviews uh, potential transactions to assess uh, the threat that a transaction poses, not only in isolated uh, context, but in the aggregate, uh, the threat it poses to the security of the United States. And we seek to impose measures uh, on the transaction to mitigate any threat successfully. And if that threat cannot be adequately mitigated, through the measures that we take, then it would be our recommendation to prevent the transaction from occurring. Uh, do you, uh, as a follow-up, do you uh, have a way of notifying relevant parties that may be targets to possible espionage from these uh, purchases? Um, there is a, a very established process that the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States, CFIUS, uh, follows with respect to the transactions and uh, the committee's engagement with the parties to the transaction. Over two years ago, on February the 11th, uh, 21, I wrote to you and asked these questions, and I'll repeat these questions later on. The first question was whether the Department of Homeland Security considers Confucius Institutes and their affiliates to be an extension of communist Chinese government, and two, if the department believed them to be purveyors of communist Chinese government propaganda. I would hope the answers to those questions would be obvious to anybody in the Biden administration. We all know that the national security threats uh, that Confucius Institutes posed uh, and we can draw that conclusion based upon what the Chinese government's own words say about these institutions. And many educational institutions have already shut down their Confucius Institutes. And yet, when you answered my February letter, July 29th of 21, you personally responded and failed to answer the critical questions. So I'm going to pose these questions to you again whether the Department of Homeland Security considers Confucius Institutes and their affiliates to be an extension of the communist Chinese government, and if the department believes them to be purveyors of communist Chinese propaganda. Uh, Senator, we are, we are very uh, concerned about the institutes that you mentioned. Uh, in fact, we are very concerned about the PRC's use of what we call non-traditional collectors of intelligence. It is why we are working with the Department of State to ensure that our visa system is secure as against that threat. Well, for any college, university, or other educational institution in the United States that maintains uh, such an institute connected with China, would you advise those educational institutions to close them based on national security reasons if not, why not? Uh, Senator, uh, we work, uh, as do others uh, in the United States government, work with uh, institutions of higher learning uh, to inform them of the threat that the PRC poses and to deliver uh, recommended safeguards to guard against uh, that threat. Okay. Uh, le let me go back to one of those first two questions I asked you just to get clarification. Do you believe uh, these institutes to be purveyors of communist Chinese government propaganda? Um, uh, I am very concerned that many of them are indeed, Senator, and we, we seek to guard against the realization of that threat. Uh, then going back to something, I was going to ask you a whole series of questions that Senator Graham already answered, but one that I want to follow up on. 
uh, is for the committee's record, would you describe which foreign drug cartels control areas of the southern border and the areas they control? The, the two um, cartels, Senator, that are of greatest concern to us are the Sinaloa cartel and the Jalisco New Generation cartel as the primary um, traffickers of synthetic opioids, including the deadly fentanyl. Okay. Uh, multiple inspectors general have found the Department of Homeland Security failed to fully vet and screen Afghan evac evacuees before entering the United States. In one report, the Defense Department Inspector General said that 50 evacuees in the United States pose potential significant national security concerns. How many Afghan evacuees are currently in the country who pose potential or actual national security concerns? Uh, uh, Senator, I, um, I respectfully um, I disagree with certain aspects of the Inspector General reports that you uh, referenced, and I would be pleased uh, to provide you uh, and your staff with a briefing with respect to the security screening and vetting that we performed uh, with respect to the Afghan nationals who were seeking a relief in the United States and the disposition of those individuals. Um, I respectfully disagree with you that this is classified and you can't answer it in this setting, but I'll go on to another question. Does the Department of Homeland Security know the location of uh, these Afghan evacuees in the United States who pose a potential national security threat, and if you don't know where they are, why you don't know where they well, are? Um, Senator, if an individual uh, poses a national security threat, uh, that individual is uh, either removed from the United States or detained. So we uh, if there are if there are other reasons for either of those dispositions to not occur. Uh, then that is something that I can share with you in an appropriate briefing. Did you, did you did you just tell me in your answer that there's none of these evacuees that are a serious threat to the United States? No, I, um, Senator. What I would like to uh, make clear, if I if I wasn't clear initially, is that we screen and vet uh, individuals uh, before they uh, arrive. If an individual does arrive, and we determine that the individual presents either a public safety or a national security threat, we will place that individual in removal proceedings and seek to detain that individual. If that disposition is not reached, there may be considerations why that is so, and I would welcome the opportunity uh, to brief you on that more specifically. Well, do you coordinate with the FBI's ongoing assessment and investigation of Afghan evacuees in the United States? Who yes, we most certainly do. Okay. On January the 23rd this year, Senator Johnson and I sent a letter to the Secret Service requesting visitor logs for President Biden's residence. Our letter, in part, is part of a review that we began in two years ago of uh, President Biden's compliance with federal rec records laws dating back to the time that he was vice, vice president. Uh, our records, our request was also based on news reports that the Secret Service was prepared to turn those records over to Congress, pursue it to a request. Since then, my and Senator Johnson's staff have been told that the, uh, your department's Office of General Counsel is the barrier to the Secret Service producing relevant material to Congress. It appears that the Office of a general counsel is being used to shield and frustrate and obstruct congressional oversight. What steps have you instructed the Office of General Counsel to take to produce the requested material to me and Senator Johnson? And uh, what legal barriers exist to producing the Secret Service visitors' logs to Congress if they can't be given to Congress? Uh, Senator, um, uh, two things. Number one, uh, uh, the directive that I have issued is for uh, our department to cooperate uh, and comply with our oversight responsibilities and the requests that are made of us. 
and two, it is certainly false that the Office of General Counsel serves as a barrier to that cooperation and compliance. Sounds to me like we'll get those records in. Is that right? I don't know um, uh, I, I, whether the Secret Service maintains visitor logs of the president's residence, um, but uh, if they do and those have been requested, we will comply with the law. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mr. Secretary, for your service, and thank you for being here. Dr. Wolvenhorst, uh, could you explain how women can still receive compassionate and necessary medical treatment from pregnancy complications without their provider performing in an abortion? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the question. I think that, um, as I said earlier in my testimony, um, when women experience complications, and in my career I have had literally hundreds of women, both here and in other countries, have complications requiring delivery. Um, when you are performing a procedure to save the life of the mother, it is not morally considered uh, an abortion, and therefore it is ethically permissible. Um, compassionate care means that you consider the circumstances carefully, you act in the best interest of both patients. If the death of the unborn child is a result of your intervention, um, that is a, a tragic outcome. But nonetheless, our priority is to uh, save the life of the mother um, and preserve her functioning, and that can be accomplished without performing an abortion. Uh, Dr. Scott, uh, there's been discussion of long-term health impacts of complications from pregnancy. Uh, data suggests that both chemical and surgical abortions can cause adverse and life-threatening health impacts. Um, can you e briefly explain and discuss the possible complications and impact on health of women that can arise from abortions, including surgical abortions or the use of the abortion pill? Yes, sir. Thank you for that question. So in my 30 years um, practicing uh, caring for women, I've cared for many women who have been harmed by abortion. I've cared for a woman who died of a second trimester um, abortion from sepsis. I have, um, in my practice, another young girl died from sepsis after a first trimester surgical abortion in which her uterus had been perforated. Um, I've cared for many, many women who have explained to me that their anxiety and depression um, is due to their unresolved guilt over an abortion. I trust those women to tell me what the cause of their concerns are. I've seen women who self-harm. Um, I've seen women who turn to substance and alcohol use and abuse um, due to this um, guilt that they have. Um, regarding chemical abortion, um, and I would like to state that, so that everyone is aware, the United States does not have any federal mandates to report any data about abortion. We do not know how many abortions occur, we do not know the complications, and we certainly don't know the deaths, um, because as I reported, it's well known that mental health deaths can follow abortion, and our CDC does not try to make that linkage at all. Um, Countries that have made this linkage have documented far higher um, mental health deaths in the year following abortion compared to childbirth, including six times as many suicides. But regarding chemical abortion, the industry tells us it's safer than Tylenol. They're comparing Tylenol overdose deaths to the um, undercounted deaths from chemical abortion. There's no comparison. Women assume they mean normal Tylenol use. They don't realize that they're comparing it to deaths that happen from overdoses. Um, the abortion industry tells us about the complications they know about, but my experience has been, because the women have been assured it is so safe, when they have a complication, they do not return to the abortion provider. They come to me as their gynecologist or they come to the emergency room in distress. And so when we look at good quality records linkage studies that detect all chemical abortions and all subsequent events, we find five to 6% of these women present to an emergency room within a month. Uh, approximately the same number will require surgery because their bodies cannot evacuate all of the dead tissue. And I am still caring for these complications in Texas, even though we've had abortion limitations for quite some time, because these drugs are circulating in the state to try to circumvent our state laws and provide abortions um, to these unfortunate women. Yeah. Dr. Wibbenhaus, 
Uh, in your opinion, how can we approach reducing mortality rates from pregnant women? And you might also touch on the fact that why is unrestricted abortion not a solution to this issue? Thank you for the question. The solution to maternal mortality, and I've been working in this area globally and in the United States for many years, is to improve health care, health education, and to increase support to pregnant women. Abortion does nothing to address any of those issues. The main causes of maternal mortality have been for years, and in the most recent CDC data from 2021, are deaths from cardiovascular causes, infection, um, embol embolus, and so on and so forth. Abortion will not reduce those deaths. You, there is no argument and no paper anywhere that shows that abortion reduces maternal mortality. There are studies that purport to do so, but when you look at the essence of the studies, what they're saying is that, well, if you reduce the number of women at r risk by performing abortions in them, that somehow reduces the number of mortalities. In point of fact, we cannot predict exactly who will have a poor outcome. We cannot predict who will have an adverse maternity outcome. And so that asks the question, how many, what percent of high-risk pregnancies should we abort? 20%, 30%, 40%? I think the other issue, um, uh, really relates to uh, community um, and uh, civil society engagement in terms of helping women to have better outcomes for their pregnancies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is my last question. The Washington Post reported your involvement in mar largo raid. It wrote that, quote, FBI agents on the case worried that prosecutors were being overly aggressive. And further, quote, Olson appealed to senior officials in FBI headquarters to push their agents to conduct the raid. Did you communicate with senior officials at FBI headquarters to push their agents to search Marowago? Senator, our, our solemn responsibility in every case is to follow the facts and the law and to do so without fear and favor or favor. We are absolutely committed to the impartial administration of justice and to upholding the rule of law, uh, which includes applying the law equally to everybody. Um, as I'm sure you can appreciate, uh, that matter is under the uh, auspices of the Office of the Special Counsel, is the um, and I'm not gonna comment further is, on it. Is the Washington Post right or wrong? So that's a matter that's uh, pending, uh, and it's an ongoing matter, and it's being handled by the Office of the Special Counsel, so I'm sure you can understand that I'm not gonna comment further. Okay, thank you, I yield. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, all of you. All for your service, and I uh, yield back to the chairman. Thanks, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Grassley. Mr. Fonzone, uh, you can't have meaningful discussions about reauthorizing 702 when government reports and court opinions are heavily redacted and hidden from the public. Will you commit to declassifying information about the FISA abuses and procedures before the 702 reauthorization deadline? And if you can't say yes to that, why not? Yes, Senator, thank you. I think we, we have recently re released a FISC opinion and that released that declassified and um, a bunch of information. And the law already requires us to review FISC opinions for for classification and release them to the public, and we're committed to making more information public about se Section 702 to assist Congress and, and the public in its consideration of renewing this authority. Mr. Olson, I heard you say in your opening uh, statement about processes you're taking to make sure that uh, people that uh, are abused are, uh, or uh, people that abuse this process are going to be uh, held accountable. Uh, you heard about the 278,000 times that it was violated. What is the Justice Department doing to punish folks who have already abused FISA? Senator, thank you for that question. And again, compliance uh, it are, includes rules and procedures, but it only works if you have accountability. Um, and that's why the FBI has instituted a comprehensive approach to accountability for the agents and analysts who use FISA but abuse the rules. Um, it's on a spectrum for intentional misuse. Agents and analysts can be fired. In fact, one person was fired for wrongfully uh, violating the rules intentionally with respect to FISA. But the vast majority of the mistakes we've seen are not intentional, and the FBI has announced today, uh, Deputy Director Bate talked about a three strikes approach of escalating penalties that include notes in a personnel file, loss of access to FISA data, 
um, and, and other measures, to including retraining, to ensure that uh, individuals are tracked over time if they're repeat offenders. Uh, so uh, there's, a, again, a range of, of, of repercussions in discipline, and I, and, and I know the deputy director and the director of the FBI take this very seriously. Okay. Mr. I have a point of personal privilege before I start my questioning. I want you to know that Senator Johnson and I were accused of spreading Russian disinformation for two and a half years, and everybody now knows that we were not spreading Russian disinformation on an inv in investigation that we were doing. Uh, Dr. Pelkey, you were fired from your position at 538. WikiLeaks later revealed an explicit campaign against you. The editor of Think Progress, a website that's part of the lobbying arm of a far left wing Center for American Progress, uh, wrote the following in an email to billionaire dark money Democrat donor Tom Steyer. Quote, I think it's fair to say that without climate progress, the environmental arm of Think Progress, Pilkey uh, would still be writing on climate change for 538. Why do you believe you were fired from 538 and smeared in the media? Yeah, thank you. Um, I had written a piece. Uh, I was hired by Nate Silver to, to write for 538. Um, and since climate change was so contested, I said, well, if you let me write something about sports, I'll also write about climate change. My first piece was to summarize an IPCC report. Um, in 2012, the IPCC re released a report, a special report on extreme events. And, and it was straight up IPCC consensus science that I wrote about. Um, what I said in that piece was that uh, disaster costs are increasing, but they're increasing because we have more stuff, more property, more buildings in harm's way. Uh, that's what the IPCC concluded. Um, there was an organized campaign released years later. Um, uh, and you never think, know where you'll find yourself. I was in the WikiLeaks. Um, and it was organized by Center for American Progress along with a climate scientist named Michael Mann. Um, and they were very explicit why they wanted me to be removed. My message even though it was on consensus science, was not politically comfortable or acceptable. So it was a very clear reason why I was attacked. Uh, my only uh, regret is that the editors at 538 didn't stand firm and say, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna support uh, strong science. Mr. Walter, witnesses called to testify before this committee this year by the majority work for organizations that have received dark money from Arabella advisors, the president of the Niskanen, uh, center uh, even admitted on the record to receiving funding from anonymous donors in the past, but in the 10 climate hearings, Democrats have never asked a single one of their witnesses about their receipts of dark money, let alone attempted to impugn the integrity or accuse them of conspiracy. Why do you think that is, and how does Arabella advisors influence Democratic legislators, and why is the Democratic dark money conveniently ignored by the left? Uh, thanks for the question, Senator. Uh, I can't explain uh, exactly why your colleagues aren't willing to look at the dark money ties of their own witnesses, because of course they're very extensive and influencewatch.org, uh, our website would provide lots of information on that. Um, Arabella is a stunningly powerful. Uh, it, it affects the executive branch, it affects regulations, uh, it affects legislation uh, with, as I said, billions of dollars a year, um, some of it from, uh, from foreign uh, donors. Now, uh, one of my favorite examples of this would be that um, the, almost the entire Biden regulatory uh, agenda has been shaped by an especially uh, dark bit of Arabella called Governing for Impact. Um, and uh, interestingly, that uh, has ties to a witness that appeared at the last hearing where I had the honor of testifying to Chairman, Gra uh, Chairman Whitehouse. Uh, are any Democratic witnesses on this panel linked to the web of uh, liberal dark money donations? Uh, yes, just today you have uh, a witness, for instance, who spent years at the group called Crew, uh, which is tied to the dark money of Empire of David Brock and other dark money. Uh, you have a witness who's connected to a nonprofit that receives money from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, uh, which is one of the donors tied up in the Arabella Network. Uh, Mr. Dr. Orzeski, uh, the environmental law firm Cher Edling receives funding by way of the Resource Legal Fund 
and the Arabella Advisors New Adventure Fund from foreign and domestic elites to promote progressive climate policies, Democratic dark money giant George Soros and Leonard DiCaprio are uh, among their donors. Are you currently or have you ever been retained by the environmental law firm Cher Edling? Yes, I have, and I work on the opportunity to talk about the case that I consulted on, San Mateo versus Chevron, where the people of San Mateo County have sued for redress because of the damages that that county and the state of California is experiencing from sea level rise caused by climate change caused by their product, oil and gas. My time's up. Thank you. Senator Stabenow. Thank you and welcome to the committee. On December 2022 hearing on sexual abuse of inmates in federal prisons, you testified that contraband is beginning of sexual assault. Those few words are a quote from you. Inspector General Horowitz agreed and asked for increased penalties for contraband smuggling. Do you agree with Inspector General Horowitz's request for increased penalties? Uh, he and I have discussed that. I think that every tool needs to be considered in order to con uh, combat this significant issue of contraband, and I think this would be an additional tool in our toolbox. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in your professional opinion, could giving design drawings for U.S.-based correctional facilities to foreign officials who work for cartels threaten American security? Senator, we would want those floor pans very secured. Uh, a release of anything like that would be a serious security concern at the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Okay. Uh, last week, I released a 76-page report on foreign operations in Mexico disclosing the Colorado Department of Corrections in coordination with the State Department agreed to share drawings from Colorado State Penitentiary One facilities with Mexico's Secretary of Public Security. We know now that certain uh, uh, Secretary of Public Security leadership was working with the Sinaloa cartel. I'm asking if you could investigate what information the United States gave the Mexican government about U.S.-based correctional facilities and ask, uh, assess the impact on uh, Bureau of Prison security. Senator, I don't know that I would be the appropriate component or entity to investigate what information was exchanged. What I can tell you as the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, we would be very careful of whom we shared our uh, blueprints and designs with um, as it relates to safety and security. I like the last half of your question. Uh, in regard to the first half, you said you couldn't uh, go to the State Department and get that information. I'm not saying I can't. I'm not sure I'm the right entity to investigate that situation in Colorado. Well, I think, I think you'd want to know if our own government would be involved in sharing information on prisons generally because they might be doing it for prisons under your, under your leadership. I can certainly look into it, Senator, and get back to you. Okay. Well... If you look into it, I'd like to know what you find out. And if you get the information that I've been trying to get, I'd sure like to have it. So I hope you'll share that with us. But tell us one way or the other if you can get that information. And if you can't get it, tell me why you can't get it. Because I think it's very important that you know whether our government is sharing information on our prison layouts with a foreign country. Uh, according to the Department of Justice Inspector General report from this year, it found that inmate on staff sexual misconduct is widespread across the Bureau of Prison Facilities and primarily affects female employees. The report also found that in 2021, there were 2,047 sustained allegations of inmate on staff sexual assaults based on five categories of offenses, yet the Bureau of Prison only used two categories of offenses uh, in its First Step Act report and identified seven 
sustained allegations, there is a significant difference. So, Madam Director, please explain why the Bureau of Prisons didn't use the same category of offenses as the Inspector General, and what steps has the Bureau of Prison taken to ensure its data is full and complete so that future First Step Act reports offer Congress a full picture? Thank you, Senator. I'll have to look at the coding and get back to you on that discrepancy. But what I can tell you is se sexual misconduct by the individuals in our custody against our employees will not be tolerated. Not only are we working to hold them accountable, the Deputy Attorney General and I have met with all of the U.S. attorneys on multiple occasions to ask for a criminal prosecution of these individuals in order to send a clear message that not only are we going to hold them accountable administratively through our Federal Bureau of Prison sanctions, but we want them held accountable criminally as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Leslie? Yeah. Professor Perrick, uh, why are large corporations like Johnson Johnson turning to the bankruptcy system to resolve these uh, tort cases? But that leads me to your opinion. Should our focus be on the bankruptcy system or more properly on a broken mass tort system? That's a great question, Senator Grassley. Uh, I, I do think probably there's enough problems going around where both deserve some attention. Uh, but I do think that the reason why a lot of companies are opting into bankruptcy for the reasons I noted in my, my oral statement, uh, which is that if you are seeking global settlement on an expedited timeline, bankruptcy offers that. Also in terms of, there's a, there's a fear that there are a lot of non-meritorious claims entering the system. Uh, MDL has not proven adept at addressing that phenomenon. Um, and, and bankruptcy may not be adept at it either, but at least that it does represent an option at this point. So that's, I think that's the reason why a lot of corporate debtors are opting into bankruptcy, hoping to have finality, hoping to have certainty, but also hoping to settle this quickly. And that can be very good for victims, the idea of getting a recovery on a short timeline. Remember, the, these cases in MDL, if the bankruptcy didn't exist, these cases would be sent back to the MDL process. You don't get your day in court in MDL. You're, you're captive of that system. We should be very clear about that. You do not get your day in court. There are bellwether trials, but that's it. So you're along for the ride as a, as a claimant in that process as well. It's, it, it, has a lot of, it has a lot of benefits for the right type of case, but most modern mass tort cases are, are not going to thrive and reach resolution in an MDL process. Okay, Mr. Haas, can you tell us what will happen if Johnson & Johnson's currently pledge of eight and nine tenths billion runs out, and how will Johnson Johnson ensure that TELC claimants achieve a fair measure of justice into the necessary future as long as the TELC claims arise? Currently, we're in the tort system, so we will be litigating in the tort system until such a point in time that we reached another arrangement with the claimants as recommended by the bankruptcy court. And in the tort system, sir, Johnson & Johnson prevails in the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of the cases, 76% of the cases that have been tried. So to the extent that we will be litigating in the tort system, that $8.9 billion will fund litigation for decades and decades to come, in which case we believe, based upon the track record to date, that we will prevail in most of those cases because these claims are meritless. But it will take decades. The pl plaintiffs in the last bankruptcy hearing affirmatively represented and told the court that you can try no more than 20 cases a year. At that rate, it won't just be the 3,000 years to try the existing cases, but it would be 20,000 years to t uh, try the cases that they say now exist. So ultimately, at the end of the day, the $8.9 billion is going to go to one place, lawyers who are litigating this case. A bankruptcy resolution would provide, and is the only way to provide in the short term, an equitable re resolution, not only for the current claimants, but the future claimants. That is the only way that these claimants will receive their money. If you're settlement is approved, what would be the minimum settlement uh, for each uh, individual plaintiff? That ultimately is decided by the plaintiff lawyers through what's called the TDP process, which they set up a, a 
tort distribution process, effectively what it is. The number that is relevant from the company's perspective is the $8.9 billion that they requested that we provide as a condition of making that resolution. So ultimately, that is in the hands of the plaintiff lawyers. Okay. Mr. Hessler, outside of the divisional merger context, how often do you encounter non-consensual third-party releases in these tort cases? Outside of the bankrupt, oh, I'm sorry. Is that for me? Uh, yes. Outside of the mass tort context, make sure I understand your question. How often are the third party, the non consensual third party releases litigated? Within a narrow um, confine of the United States Trustee's Office, frequently brings objections to third party releases. In the mass tort context, uh, it's going to be litigated almost every time that it's included in a plan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this important hearing. Um, after a company files for... Yeah. I start with a short question, Mr. Maroro. Uh, when Mexican officials working with the United States seize precursor chemicals, what evidence, if any, does the Mexican government give the United States showing that the seized precursor chemicals were actually destroyed. Thank you for your question, uh, Senator. Uh, we take uh, corruption allegations uh, very seriously. Uh, we work hand in hand through our TCIUs with our Mexican partners. Do they show you the pictures or do they show you the destruction of the precursor? Uh, no, sir, uh, but okay. we do understand that they hire private companies for uh, the destruction of the evidence that they seize. Okay, thank you for that. Now to Mr. Kimball. The Justice Department indicted Chepito, Ch Chepitos in Southern District of California, Northern District of Illinois, District of Columbia, and the Southern District of New York. According to Justice Department, the Chepitos have the largest, most fentanyl trafficking operation in the world. The New York Times reported an interagency dispute over the Chepitos cases. Um, so to my question then, uh, has DEA headquarters always provided full support to the Southern District of California, Northern District of Illinois, District of Columbia on their Chapitos cases and other Sinaloa cartel related matters. Yes, the DA headquarters has always provided support to those offices. The Chapitos indictment was a new tactic so we could actually demonstrate how the chemical companies in China were facilitating the movement of precursors to Mexico. It was transferred to manufacturing of fentanyl by the Chapitos and brought into the United States. And that indictment encompassed that effort. Did the DEA-led Special Operation Division hold a deconflicting meeting with the Southern District of New York, Southern District of California, and the Northern District of Illinois? I do not know if they had held a meeting, no. Okay. Now, Ms. Nardi. In September, I released a report on foreign operations in Mexico. The report cites embassy documents that show the State Department hired Mexican nationals to fill U.S. government contract positions. What steps does the State Department take to vet foreign nationals that it hires? Uh, thank you for that question, Senator. I will have to get back to you with an answer on that. With a written answer? Yes. Yeah, thank you. If the State Department receives information that one of its foreign nationals hires may be committing crimes, what steps does the State Department take to protect U.S. interests? We will submit that as part of the written response. Okay. Uh, Ms. Nardi, for you, in July, the Washington Street Journal reported, quote, 
the Biden administration is discussing lifting sanctions on a Chinese police forensics institute suspected of participating in human rights abuses in a bid to secure Beijing's renewed cooperation in fighting fentanyl, end of quote. Is the administration considering lifting sanctions against China? That is uh, above my pay grade, but what I can tell you, it's the Institute of Forensic Science, which is attached to the Police Institute, which you are speaking of. They are two separate entities, but they are attached together, and that is the one that um, the PRC is asking us to lift sanctions on. There has been no action to date to do that. Okay. Uh, if the Biden administration intends to lift sanctions against China, which you said was above your uh, pay grade to secure, secure cooperation on fentanyl, would you commit to briefing members of Congress before those sanctions are lifted? Or is that something you can't answer? But I'd like to have somebody in the State Department tell me one way or the other if we can know about it. We can certainly take that back, sir. I mean, as I mentioned, the Sec Secretary Blinken will have a meeting with his counterpart soon. Certainly these issues will be among those discussed. There has been some talk of finding a way to have a working group or some sort of gathering to discuss issues that need to be resolved before we can increase cooperation. Could I ask uh, one more question along this line? Then I'll go to you. If the Biden administration lifts sanctions on China's Police Forensic Institute as reported, could you commit to ensuring that this action will not result in enabling the Chinese police forces surveillance and abuse of ethnic minorities, which is a top priority of our government? Again, Senator, I, we, will, we will include that in the written response. Okay. Thank you. Our time has expired. Let me turn it over to uh, Senator Grassley, then Senator Kane. Before I ask my first question, I see that Dr. Barker wanted to respond to Dr. Rose. Why don't you do that? Thank you, Senator Grassley. Uh, I, there. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Uh, I did not say that there were no studies indicating that rainfall, variability of rainfall had an effect. I was saying that the studies that I reviewed found that there was no effect of rainfall on GDP growth. Okay. Uh, Mr. McNally, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we've heard many politicized climate change narratives throughout our 12 climate change hearings. Unfortunately, the politicization of climate change isn't limited to the halls of Congress. How have international institutions, let's say like the International Energy Agency, uh, allowed climate alarm to uh, compromise their missions? And then in your professional opinion, which is a greater threat to global energy security and the U.S. Con uh, economy uh, climate change or top-down climate policy? <coughs> Thank you, Senator Grassley. Um, the International Energy Agency was formed after the Arab oil embargo 50 years ago this month uh, with a security mission, organize the collective use of strategic reserves, and then help us understand what's going on in oil and gas markets, including data and forecasts. And they have a bunch of hardworking, talented folks doing that, and their job is difficult. <coughs> Unfortunately, and the saddest thing I've uh, seen in my career professionally as a barrel counter, and someone spent most of his career just trying to predict what's going to happen, not influence it, is starting in 2020, the IEA stopped producing what we call current policy scenario or business as usual forecast, basically a base case that assumes policy in place today. They did that under environmental pressure because we were showing too much oil demand and too much oil supply. But by doing that, they deprived you and the Senate and the Congress uh, the tool you need to do to use to make cost-benefit uh, assessments of policy options. You also dupe the world into thinking that we're headed towards peak demand really soon, and that's very dangerous. And from that, they then came out and said there should be no more investment in oil and gas supply. Again, I think I can think of no, nothing more dangerous and disastrous uh, for our near-term and medium-term energy outlook and national security outlook than were we to effectively make peak supply real by banning investment in new oil and gas production. And in my view, uh, no question, although I'm not a climate scientist uh, nor a climate modeler, when I see things like President Biden's uh, call to outlaw the use of gas 
and, coal and, and, and gas and coal and electricity by 2035, or ban the sale or mandate the uh, restriction sale of ICE cars, um, cancel the Keystone Pipeline, uh, much less the IEA's call to ban all upstream investment, I have no question that those policies would be much more costly than any reasonable benefits we get in any other area, including po uh, climate policy. Dr. Barker, uh, you've discovered faulty economic methods used to spread climate alarm and then revealed them to the world. What statistical tricks should objective listeners look to or look out for to differentiate climate change propaganda from economic accuracy? And then why do you think economists and others use these tricks in the first place? Thank you, Senator Grassley. Uh, well, some of the easy ones uh, that we see in the popular media are talking about cost of climate change without putting them in context, either as a per percentage of GDP or with growth. I mean, if we're projecting costs out many decades in the future, uh, we need to think about what those costs are relative to the growth that we expect to see between now and then. Uh, another is that studies that I've looked at that claim that there is some kind of optimal temperature for economic uh, production uh, have difficulty with the fact that a lot of poor countries happen to be also very warm countries. Now, people have debated for many years uh, why that's the case, but we really don't know. And it's difficult to control uh, for that and look at uh, the actual effects of temperatures. But many are much harder, many of these tricks are much harder to see. I mean, for example, uh, the papers I looked at use thousands of lines of code to shape the data. Uh, and assumptions are buried in those thousands of lines of code or regressions that use 500 variables. Uh, and it, it requires a really close look to find some of the assumptions that are embedded in that work. Why do they do these tricks? Well, I think as an economist, we know that uh, uh, incentives matter. And uh, when the incentive is to publish, uh, people publish and, uh, pub and conclusions that fit the dominant ideas are easier to publish than papers that challenge those ideas. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, could I have 45 seconds to Please. just kind of close up here? Uh, we continue to receive testimony that relies on extreme RCP 8.5 scenario. Uh, climate scientist Dr. Roger Pico, uh, Pico uh, testified in June that the real world is actually tracking below this extreme scenario. Dr. Pilko uh, also said, quote, every day that we continue to prioritize the most extreme scenario in research and policy is a day that we mislead ourselves, end of quote. So in summation, we should both invite climate scientists who have the ability to speak to the validity of scientific assertion, and there isn't a single senator or witness in this room who is qualified to do so right now. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield time. Thank you, Senator Butler. Uh, Senator Grassley is next. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses. Under Biden's leadership, family unit housing centers were shut down. Illegal immigrants were electronically tracked instead of being detained. Children became tools for criminals to avoid detention. Uh, Congress has demanded answers, and we've been met with silence delay or worse yet, a flat out refusal to take responsibility. And I want you to know that I have the same uh, sort of outrage you heard from Kennedy and Blackburn. Now this isn't just a situation that affects uh, the federal government and a few states at the border. This, uh, the failures that I've talked about at the federal <laughs> level have created problems for us even in Iowa at the state and local level. Worse yet, federal government has failed these kids. So in August, I wrote to Iowa's law enforcement people, primarily the 99 county sheriffs. They told me that the cartels didn't just traffic humans and drugs at the border. The cartels have a presence in communities across the United States and are particularly active Along the major highways in Iowa, we have the Sinaloa and the CJNJ uh, cartels. 
Uh, now in uh, the counties of Green, Story, Marshall, and Polk County, right at, at the heart where the I-35 meets I-80, those two highways cut across the United States. This problem is not unique to Iowa. These cartels are active in many states across the country. So to Director uh, Morant, uh, what steps has Homeland Security Investigations taken to uh, uh, combat cartels in the interior of our nation, and what tools would be helpful in rooting them out? Can you provide a detailed plan uh, to, uh, to Congress by the end of the year to accomplish this? Thank you for that question. As to the first part of that, HSI deploys a very robust strategy to disrupt and dismantle all transnational criminal organizations. We also uh, use a force multiplier of vetted units overseas to try and push the border out before these crimes enter our borders. So we have a very, very uh, active uh, criminal strategy that deals with criminal activity, not only within the United States, but outside of the United States. Um, can you provide, you're going to have a comprehensive plan by the end of November? I would have to take that back, sir. Okay. Well, uh, also to you, the New York Times reported back in February that over at least two, the last two years, HHS could not reach more than 85,000 children it placed the sponsors. So do you, how many of the 85,000 missing children Missing Children has Homeland Security investigations and its law enforcement partners been able to track down? HSI responds to every instance of human trafficking that we're made aware of as soon as we're made aware of it. But you don't have a number for us, the, the number that you've actually been able to track down? Uh, for specific numbers, I'd have to take that back. Well, can you get us an answer in writing? I'll take that back, sir. You mean you can't even tell me if you can get an answer in writing the number of people that's been affected? And the response will be in writing, Senator. Last Friday, I received an HHS response to a letter that I sent back in December. The response mentions that the Office of Refugee Resettlement recognizes the importance of notifying local Authorities, when abuse and neglect of unaccompanied children is suspected or uncovered. Director Dun Marcos, uh, how many times did ORR and its third parties notify state and local authorities with concerns about possible child abuse or neglect? Thank you, Senator, for that question. There are numerous ways um, and at different time periods that a referral may be made to local law enforcement, HSI, um, or the Office of Trafficking in Persons. Um, that can happen while they are in our care. It can happen after they've been released from our care. They can be reported by the child themselves, by the sponsor, by the post-release service uh, provider. So there's a number of, of different times um, that, that these reports um, can be made. Um, for specific numbers, I would want to be precise, so I will take that back. Okay. Uh, I, uh, you said you were a humanitarian and all the people on the group would, uh, witnesses would probably say the same thing. And I'm not going to argue with with whether you're humanitarian or not, but I hope you realize that not enforcing the law at the border puts us in a position of a life or death situation. You have people on the uh, terrorist watch list that can't get on an airplane to come into this country, but they come across the, the river and, and get into this country. Uh, 800, 900 people die in the desert, uh, get lost in the desert and die. We have criminals coming here and creating murders. We have rape on women uh, coming through Mexico. We have human trafficking. Uh, you have the fentanyl killing 112,000 people. Uh, you're dealing with a life or death situation by not the enforcing of the law. And the Constitution says that the f laws should be faithfully executed, and they aren't being. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat>